Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, brief, bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, the host, and thanks for joining. Hope you had a nice weekend. Or a nice Taco Tuesday, or fill in the blank. It's weird to me that people could be listening to this at any time, like minutes after I say it, or even years from now. It's super strange to me. And do I tend to overthink even the most pointless things? Absolutely I do. And some of you do it too, so don't make me feel like I'm the only one here. We're happy, free, confused, and lonely at the same time. It's miserable and magical. Before we get going with your story today, this is your reminder to subscribe to 10 Minute Murder so that you'll always be able to find the show and never miss an episode. Connect with 10 Minute Murder on social media too. If you have friends that like true crime stories and maybe a host that sneaks in Taylor Swift lyrics when you least expect it, let them know about this podcast as well. Links are in the show notes of this episode as well as at 10minutemurder.com. Now, to the story. So many serial killers' backstories begin with a bizarre childhood, and Earl Nelson's was no exception. Earl's grandmother, who raised him after his parents died from syphilis in 1899, was deeply concerned when he started behaving strangely after hitting his head when he fell off of a bike. He'd always been a morbid and depressed child, leading to him being expelled from school at the age of seven. But after the bike accident left him unconscious for almost a week, he seemed like a completely different child. He woke up from his coma with memory loss, crippling headaches, and unpredictable behavior, which never went away. Earl's behavior got worse and worse as he grew older. He was having conversations with people who weren't there, spying on his female relatives in the nude, and manically quoting passages from the Bible. In his teenage years, he continued to spiral, spending a lot of time drunk and visiting brothels. Even as a young teen, Earl was also incredibly strong, to the point where he had a reputation for picking up heavy weights using only his teeth. Earl's crimes began small, with breaking and entering. He developed a pattern of joining different military branches and then deserting a month or so later. And after his absurd behavior was noticed on one of these stents, he was committed to a mental hospital. His psychologist noted that Earl was experiencing constant delusions and paranoia, but didn't seem like that he was being violent in any way, didn't see that potential in him. After Earl escaped from the mental hospital several times, he was discharged from both the Navy and the hospital, only to end up marrying a 60-year-old woman, Mary Martin, who he met while he was working at a hospital as a janitor under a fake name. Their marriage was not a happy one, with Earl continuing to suffer from delusions, fits of rage, and then became increasingly aggressive towards Mary. After Earl got more violent, Mary left him. It was 1921 when Earl made his first attempt at a more serious crime. Pretending that he was a plumber, he broke into a local residence with the intention of molesting a 12-year-old girl named Mary Summers. However, Mary was able to escape and scream for help. Earl fled the scene, but was captured and transferred back to the same mental hospital. He was discharged four years later, and his time in the hospital didn't seem to have curbed his appetite for violence. And again, under a fake name, Earl posed as a tenant wanting to stay at a boarding house of a 60-year-old landlady, Clara Newman. He strangled Clara to death, committed necrophilia with her corpse, and then hid her body in an empty apartment in the building. Less than two weeks later, he attacked his second victim, Laura Beale, another landlady in her 60s who once again was strangled to death. From 1926 to mid-1927, it seemed that the killer was on a rampage. More and more victims went missing, and the killing seemed to follow the same M.O. He targeted landladies, found his victims through advertisements of rooms to rent in the newspaper, and gained their trust by pretending that he wanted to rent a room from them. It's likely that Earl's obsession with the Bible made his victims more likely to trust him, thinking that he was a studious Christian man. Once his victims let their guard down, Earl would then murder them, usually by strangling them to death. Sometimes he committed necrophilia after their death, but other times he seemed content just to kill them. The body would usually be hidden underneath a bed, but in some attacks behind a furnace or in a closet. It was the greatest betrayal of trust, being invited into someone's home 
and then brutally attacking them and taking their life. The public was panicked about the idea of there being a killer on the loose, and landladies were urged to avoid advertising rooms for sale or even meeting with strangers alone. With this pattern of landladies being strangled to death becoming more and more obvious as Earl's victim count rose, the police soon realized they were dealing with the serial offender, but they didn't know who. Witness reports described seeing a dark, muscular man with exceptionally long arms and big hands lurking around the area of the crimes. And so Earl Nelson's nickname was born, the Gorilla Killer, or the Gorilla Man. As well as the violent nature of the attacks, the most terrifying about the Gorilla Killer was how frequently he killed, murdering as often as once every three weeks. The frequency increased at the end of Earl's killing spree with his last victim, a landlady named Emily Patterson, being the fifth murder that Earl committed in less than two weeks. Earl's killing spree finally came to an end after he was identified by a jeweler as a man who had come into his shop to sell a wedding ring, which turned out to belong to Earl's final victim, Emily Patterson. When the police gave Earl Nelson's description to the barber next door, the barber reported that he had given a haircut to Earl on the day that Emily Patterson was killed, and he had noticed bloody scratch marks on the man's scalp during the haircut. All boarding houses in the area were searched by police. A search of Miss August Hill's guest house, where Earl had recently slept, unearthed a grisly discovery. Stashed under the bed in Earl's room, there was a mutilated, naked corpse. The body was identified as Lola Cohen, a 14-year-old girl who had gone missing four days earlier. It was clear to the police that after killing Lola and mutilating her body much more viciously than the bodies of his other victims, Earl had then spent the night sleeping above Lola's corpse. After her body was found, the search for Earl Nelson became urgent. Canadian police believed that the guerrilla killer had fled to America and sent his description to all police stations in the U.S. The descriptions led to the arrest of a man going by the name of Mike Mowski on the 14th of June. But after one night in jail, Mike Mowski escaped. Two days later, another arrest was made, a man who fit the description of Earl Nelson, but told police his name was Virgil Wilson. Once again, Virgil Wilson managed to make an escape. But 12 hours later, Earl boarded a train that contained several police officers. They immediately recognized him, and he was arrested less than a day after escaping jail the last time. Despite having his fingerprints and photographs taken, Earl continued insisting that he wasn't Earl Nelson. He was Virgil Wilson. Not only did his fingerprints prove that he was lying about his identity, they also matched the fingerprints found at the crime scenes, and the measurements of his teeth were a match to bite marks that had been found on the guerrilla killer's victims. The bizarre behavior that Earl had shown during his entire life continued while he was under arrest. For a while, he admitted that he was the killer, saying, quote, I only do my lady killings on Saturday nights. Then he backpedaled and insisted that he was completely innocent. Earl Nelson's trial, where he was charged for the murders of Lola Cohen and Emily Patterson, as well as burglary and attempted molestation, took place on the 1st of November, 1927, as well as more than 60 other testimonies from witnesses. His ex-wife, Mary Martin, was willing to testify against him. and She didn't hold back telling the courts that Earl was absolutely insane. The judge took less than an hour to make the decision. Earl Nelson was guilty of murder and sentenced to death. Despite Earl's history of head injury and multiple witness reports of him talking to himself and suffering delusions, an appeal of his death sentence on the grounds of insanity was rejected. The psychiatrist who had assessed him five times before his trial testified in court, saying, quote, I didn't find any evidence that, to me, would constitute insanity. Whether Earl was truly insane, suffering the effects of a serious brain injury, or simply pretended to be mad is still unknown. Until the day of his execution, Earl continued to claim that he was innocent of the 22 murders that he's believed to have committed, 21 women and one infant. On the 13th of January, 1928, he was hanged after saying his final words. I forgive those who have wronged me.